So wonderful to be back here with you all. It is such a privilege to be part of this wonderful congregation and experience this hope for Africa. I've been so blessed with all of the music that's been going on on this stage. I'm privileged just to be here. Now, the last time I was with you, I was talking about a serious topic, depression. And as I've said, we've been doing, we've been going through all of these colors so far, and depression was the gray one. And I mentioned that one of the keys to beating depression is learning how to let go and forgive. Now, it's easy to say that, but it's difficult to do. So tonight, what I want to do is focus a little bit more on forgiveness. And I've entitled the program, Bitter or Better. Now, 1844, 1844 was a very interesting year, don't you think? In church history, in world history, very interesting year. But I'd like to take you all on a journey to France and to a man who came from Africa but was living in France. His name was Alexander Dumont. And in 1844, he had finished, I believe, his greatest work. He'd already written The Three Musketeers. Maybe you didn't know an African man wrote that. But in 1844, he did his best work, which was The Count of Monte Cristo. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. If you haven't, you can read it, you can see the films, there are many versions. But The Count of Monte Cristo is a film and a book about revenge. It's a good man. It was a good man who was betrayed by his best friend. His best friend took his money took his wife, took everything he had, had him thrown into prison. And whilst he was in prison, his father passed away. The one thing that kept Edward Dante alive was the thought, I'm going to get out of prison and I'm going to kill that old friend who is now my enemy. You see, he believed, like many of us, revenge is sweet, but sadly, it has a bitter aftertaste. You see, many of these negative emotions that we have, bitterness, envy, rage, jealousy, all of these things that build up inside of us, they have a common root. And that common root is a lack of forgiveness. It's a lack of forgiveness. Now, the Bible talks a lot about forgiveness, but my best story about forgiveness is what Jesus gives us in the book of Matthew of the parable of the unmerciful servant. For those of you who don't know it, let me just pre-say it for you. You see, it talks about a man who owed his boss an awful lot of money, more money than he could ever repay. And one day the boss said, look, you've got to pay me back. And the man said, well, I don't have the money. Um, can you give me some more time? The man said, look, if you don't pay me, I'm going to have you thrown into prison until you can pay. He couldn't pay, so he begged his boss, please give me more time. The boss looked at him and said, look, I'm not just going to give you more time, I'm going to cancel your debts. Now, I just want you to think about that for a moment. Imagine all of your debts cancelled. No mortgage, no car loan, no bank loan, everything is cancelled, you're now free. Imagine how you'd feel. Well, that's exactly how he felt. He left the presence of his boss happy. But then he saw somebody outside who owed him a small amount of money. And he grabbed hold of him and he said, you better pay me that money back. And if you don't, I'm going to have you put into prison. The man asked for more time. He gave him no time at all. So his boss called him back and said, look, um, I forgave you loads of money. How come you couldn't forgive just a little bit? And it said that in anger, his master had him thrown into jail where he would be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. Now, if you're in prison, I don't know how you can pay back. So I guess he didn't get out of prison. 
And here's the interesting thing that Jesus said, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Now here's the thing, surely he doesn't mean torture, does he? Well, he said it, because surely there are lots of people even here today who haven't forgiven. Are they being tortured? Are they in prison? Well, let me show you how Jesus was exactly right. Now, for this, I need another volunteer. Can I have a volunteer up here, please? Some, one person. Or do I have to pick the person? Everybody's looking away from me. I can, feel, I can actually hear your blood pressure rising as I'm speaking. So let me take one volunteer. Um, Mr. President, come, come. Yes. Okay. So you can see this picture that everybody can see. Can you tell me, yes, it'd be good to have a mic. Can you tell me what this machine is? What this machine is connected to this man? Do you know what that is? That one is, um, which machine is that? Uh, yeah, uh, it's a test. Theroding machine. It's a what? Theroding machine. Well, c can anybody else help? What is it? Nobody knows what it is? Uh, yes, okay. It's a lie detector test. A lie detector. But thank you, Pastor. Thank you. You can take your seat back. You take your seat. It's a lie detector. It's a lie detector. Now, let me ask you a question. How on earth can a machine tell that a person is lying? How? A machine doesn't even have a brain. How does it know? Right, yes. When you're lying, your blood pressure goes up, so it detects it. When you're lying, your pulse goes up as well. When you're lying, you sweat more. You're, you breathe deeper and quicker. All of these things happen, and even the best liars, and there are some very good liars, find it very difficult to fool the polygraph. That's the posh name for a lie detector test. So that means something is going on inside the body every time we lie. By the way, it doesn't go up when you're telling the truth. Nothing happens in the body when you're telling the truth, only when you're lying. So something within us, the spirit within us, is telling us something is wrong when we lie. And every time we have any bitterness, or any time we see that person and we haven't forgiven them, the same things happen within us, exactly the same as when we're lying. It produces the same result. When you look at this picture of the brain, what happens, we get a stress response. The center of our brain, the hypothalamus, releases a signal to our pituitary gland. It's a little gland in the middle of our brains. That then releases chemicals into the blood, cortisol, adrenaline, uh, well, cortisol, which releases a hormone into the blood that hits the adrenal glands, and the adrenal glands then release cortisol and adrenaline. That's our stress hormones that gets us ready for fighting and flight. So that means all that stress in the head can lead to all of these other diseases that we've talked about, because stress is at the heart of many of these diseases. That's the physical, that's the physical result of it. But look, when we are unable to forgive, when we are unable to let go, it doesn't just affect us physically, it affects us emotionally. You know, we become untrusting and unloving. Families tend to break down. Our relationships all around us, whether in marriage or in society, they break down because we cannot trust. Sometimes when it goes even too far, we get to the place, as we said, where we get depressed. We can't actually release any positive emotions. We're trapped in this depression. So, when Jesus said, you will be trapped, tormented, and tortured if you don't forgive, think of all of these things that can happen to our body, our mind, and our spirit. It's exactly that. We are having so many imprisonments from disease, physical, emotional, spiritual, because we cannot let go and we cannot forgive. So what Jesus said was exactly right. In fact, I like this statement which says, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting your enemy to die from it. It doesn't hurt the enemy. 
It can only hurt us, and it hurts us in a dramatic way. So we have to learn how to forgive. In fact, God gives us a definition of true forgiveness. When you look in the book of Luke chapter 6, verses 32 to 36, Jesus is saying something quite interesting. He is saying, look, if you give to people who give to you, well, that's no credit. Everybody does that. Even the wicked people do that. If you are kind to people who are kind to you, again, that's no big deal. You know, some of the most wicked people on earth are kind to the people close to them. There is a wonderful poem called Mother, beautiful poem, talking about the relationship of a young man to his mother. It was written by a man called Adolf Hitler. Even Hitler is kind to the people close to him. So that's no big gain, no big benefit. What Jesus is saying in this verse, in these verses, is when somebody hurts you, you need to bless them. I, I see and hear silence around. When somebody steals from you, you are to lend to them. Does that make sense? If somebody has abused you in the past, you're to be kind to them. That is the definition of forgiveness that Jesus gives us. Now, I know it doesn't make sense. And it makes it even worse when Jesus said, look, unless you forgive, you cannot be forgiven. Now, this is a hard thing to take, right? Now, I've come to give you some encouragement. I don't think I've encouraged you so far. Maybe you feel a little bit worse. But I am going to give you some encouragement because we all need it. This forgiveness is, I believe, at the heart of health. If we can learn to forgive ourselves and to forgive other people, we can be free. So let's take some encouragement. And the number one thing is that God sees when we've been mistreated and He will restore. You know, when God restores, He doesn't restore you back to where you were. When He restores, He takes you to a better place than you were in the past. You look in the Old Testament, if somebody stole an ox from you, they couldn't just give you back an ox. They'd have to give you back four oxen, seven oxen, sometimes ten oxen. That's God's definition of restoration. So when we are being mistreated and we want to be bitter towards that person, we have to remember that God will restore. I love this text in the Bible from Joel 2.25. It says, I will restore the years that the locust has eaten. The years that the locust has eaten. Can you imagine this? Look, when the locusts come onto your crops and they devour your crops, they're not coming to pay you back. They're going on to the next field, the next farm, and they're going to eat their crops. But God is saying, even though they've consumed your crops, I will restore, and not just restore the crops. I'm going to restore the years that you've put into the crops. Some of us can be in relationships, and we think that, that I've, I've invested all my time into that relationship, and now I've been abandoned. God will restore the years. I've, I've put all my time into this business, all my money, my time, my effort, and I'm gone bankrupt. God will restore. We need to learn to remember that so that we can now forgive. We can now be released to forgive. Now, I'm sure none of you recognize this building, but this building is in the center of London, and it is where I lived for a, a year or so when I was a student. We had about several hundred students in this building. It's called Nutford House. And I became the president of the student union. Let's say that. That's what it's called. Now, I did a few things in that building, and the owners of the building decided that, you know what? We like you, Chitty. We would like you to live here as long as you want for half the fee if you become our senior student. Now, I was at university, so I wasn't silly. I said, yes, thank you. Now, 
A few weeks later, one of the relatives of the owners of the building moved in. And they said, oh, Chitty, instead of you, we're going to give it to her instead. I said, well, look, you agreed to give it to me. If you don't want me to have it, fine, I'll have to find somewhere else to live. Now, my friends at the time said, Chitty, why did you let them get away with it? You know, that was a cushy number. That you could have been there living in that room for years at a cheap price. And this is London, so, you know, it, a cheap price is pretty important. I didn't know. I just said, well, look, I'll just have to wait and see. God's got a plan for me. I don't know. Ah, you and your God. Well, look, I had to leave that place. I managed to scrape some money together, and I put a deposit down on an on apartment that was closer to the medical school. But then I got two students to live with me, and they were paying my mortgage. So I was actually living there without paying anything. Some people might have said amen to that. I, I don't think people are worried about money here, obviously. Now, something happened, though. A few years down the line, because I bought the place for 90,000 pounds, 90,000 pounds, two years down the line, I realized that the place was now worth 300,000 pounds. Still no amens. Okay, all right. By the, time, by the time I left medical school, because I know you're not interested, but I'll just tell you, the amount had grown an awful lot, okay? So, I then used some of that money to open up a restaurant. Then I opened up another one. These were vegetarian restaurants in the heart of London. They did quite well. No amens. Um, <laughs> right. So, they did quite well. Now, do you think that I went back to Nutford House and said to them, you robbed me. I should still be living in that one room where I have to share the bathroom with 50 different other guys. You robbed me. Do you think I went back to them? No. I went back to them to thank them. Because if I wasn't kicked out of that house, I wouldn't have had all that God had in store for me. God had restored the years that the locust had eaten. And that's what he wants to do for all of us. We cannot stay bitter. If we stay bitter, we're missing the mark. God wants to make us better. Even when you're standing before your enemy, he still wants to make you better. We are able to forgive if we understand this. Everybody knows the story of David and Goliath. But I always say, when David was in front of Goliath, I don't think he saw Goliath the way we see him. You see, many of us read that story and we say, well, Goliath was sent to destroy David. But the Bible tells me something else. It says Goliath was sent to promote David. Because David, when he met Goliath and left him, was promoted from a shepherd to a king. If he never met Goliath, well, where would he be? Great shepherd. Many of us are facing Goliaths in our lives today. We're facing huge Goliaths. Goliaths of health. You know, when you get that diagnosis from the doctor, that's a Goliath. Financial Goliaths. I know we know about that. What about Goliaths in the family? Lacking love abuse, whatever. These are Goliaths that are very difficult to overcome. And we look at them like Goliath and we say, this is here to defeat me. But God can use that Goliath to promote you, just like David. So when that, when that test comes, when that abuse comes, when that theft comes, we must look at it like this Goliath is here to promote me, not defeat me. Now, we've talked a little bit about this in our meetings. Why does bad stuff happen to good people? I don't have all the answers. I like what Elder Finley has to say, and he'll be saying more. But a small answer is, look, I don't think God is content with good people. He wants to have great people. And if you go to the library and you go to read any of the autobiographies of great men and women of old, none of them had an easy life. None of them said, oh, you know, I came from a happy family. 
I had everything in front of me, and I became great. It just doesn't happen like that. It comes through difficulty. You look through your Bible. All of these great men and women in the Bible, none of them had an easy life. All of them had lives that we really wouldn't want. So God is not content with us being good. He wants to promote us to be great. And that comes with difficulty. That comes with difficult people who may steal from you, abuse you. But God doesn't want to use that to make you bitter. He wants you to be better. Okay. Now, my last tip is to how to turn two into four. This is not a mathematical question. It's actually how to turn the word two into four. Okay. I know you don't understand what I'm saying, so I'm going to explain it for you. Um, let me take you back to 2009, the inauguration. I don't know if you remember that. Um, in America, uh, I took the trouble to travel to Washington from England to be at the inauguration. And I was actually in the crowd. You can probably see me at the back somewhere there. <laughs> w when I say I was at the back, I was at the back. Right? I couldn't see anything. <laughs> But I was there. It was a freezing cold day, but it was a great day because everybody was celebrating that Barack Obama, hmm, does he have some links to this area? I think he has a few links to this area. You know, um, there was a man called Tom Mboya. Do you, you remember that man, Tom Mboya? He had a great vision in Kenya, right? Great vision. And he went to the United States and he said, well, look, we want to get we want to get some of our brightest students from Kenya to go to some of the best universities in America. This became, it was called the airlift. Wonderful stuff. And lots of students went to America, went to the best universities. You know, one of the first men to go to America was Barack Obama's father. One of the very first men to do that. And then we get President Barack Obama. Look, when I was there, before the inauguration, on the news they were saying he was studying to be president. Studying to be... How do you study to be president? Well, actually, he ended up studying this man, Abraham Lincoln, still considered the greatest president of the United States. And this was a truly great man. He united the United States. He ended slavery. A great man did wonderful work. He wasn't just a great president, he was actually quite a wise man. This is what he had to say. The best way to destroy an enemy is to make him a friend. That was one of the most powerful men at the time, but he was humble as well. Now, one would ask, well, what made Abraham Lincoln so good? And I always say, well, just look at his life. His life will give you an indication of how he got there. Look at the life of Abraham Lincoln. As a child, his family lost their home, he had to work to support them. Then his mother died. He went into business and failed. He ran for office and lost. He went into a second business, it went bankrupt, he lost everything. He went for office and won, then his fiance died. He had a nervous breakdown. He tried to pick himself up, go for another office, and then he lost again. It doesn't stop there, it goes on. He sought to be an elector and lost. He then ran for Congress and lost. He got a break. He won in Congress, but then he ran for election and lost again. He ran for Senate and lost. He ran for Vice President and lost badly. Now, look, at this point, I think many of his family and friends were saying, Abraham, give up on politics. You're not very good at it. Try something else. You know, maybe be a doctor, something easier, you know? Do, do something easy, simple. But he didn't stop there. Because he, he came back down, he tried to be a Senate, and he lost again, but two years later, he was elected the President of the United States. Now, Abraham Lincoln discovered something that most of us don't understand. All the negative things that were happening to him weren't actually happening to him, they were happening for him. They were developing him. The negative losses 
the knockbacks, the defeats. It wasn't God trying to punish you. It is God trying to prepare you. When people even steal from you, when you have those relationship breakdowns that you think is totally unfair, it is to develop us, not to defeat us. That is exactly why God allows us to go through these problems. And that is why we are able to forgive. Because we know that God is looking out for us. It doesn't matter who this person is in standing in our way. We can release the bitterness because we know God has got a better plan for us. That relationship that was destroyed, God has a better plan. He has a better business. He can restore your health. And if you've been watching over the last few days, you will see that Sister Finley has been showing us how you, your health can be restored with simple principles. One of them yesterday was love, the key to health, really the key to health. So defeats didn't happen to Abraham Lincoln, they happened for him. Now I'm just going to play this video as we draw up, draw up to a close, and then I'm just going to get you to do something for me, and we will understand how we can learn to forgive.
Now that's quite difficult to watch, but we're in the place of the unmerciful servant. He's paid everything for us. He's forgiven us everything. Whatever our little thing is, we need to let it go for our health and for our future. Amen.